And I want to invite him back up here to share with us again this afternoon. And let's start uh, with, a, with a prayer. Father in heaven, your spirit has been evident here. We know you're desirous of us drawing closer and closer to you as you are lifted up. Help that to be the case this afternoon as Dr. Dane shares with us again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, are we on? No. no. Okay. No. So, here we go. All right, that's our topic. You're not on. I'm not on. Don't need it. I need to turn this thing on then. Does somebody know how to turn it on? I think it's inside here. Okay, are we on now? All right, cool. Okay, now we're on. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to talk this afternoon about um, something that's really relevant for our time because we're living in the end of the end time judgment. Now, I have another whole presentation that could walk you through the uh, 2300 days prophecy and seven steps. It can be boiled down into something very simple or in my little book called um, Who's Afraid of the Judgment? I do it in about 10 steps in about six and a half pages. So that can be done to show uh, 1844 is when the end time day of atonement judgment begins. So the question is that a lot of people have, however, uh, the judgment is a, a very scary thing and what is it? what difference does it make to me? So what if I have this end time present truth? And so they um, need to deal with the question of fear. I, I don't know about you, but when I read Ellen White's um, statement in The Great Controversy, where she says that at the close of probation, at the end of the judgment, we will live, we will stand before a holy God without a mediator, I, I find that rather, found that rather terrifying, and I think many people do today. Um, what is the judgment? How does that help uh, affect us? What view do we have of that? So let's um, get started here. Judgment inspires fear. Huh? Is this what you think of when you think of the judgment? Yeah? <clears throat> Got him. Okay. And, uh, but um, judgment doesn't have to inspire fear. Um, oh, what about this one? Does that inspire fear? This is a well-known Adventist picture. And let's do a little art criticism here. Art criticism means to not just criticize in a negative sense, but appreciating uh, various points. So let's do a little of criticism, and you tell me about the theology of this picture, okay? The theology of the picture. We have this man in a suit, standing before the tables of the law. Jesus is way up there, myriads of angels are around. Now, of course, we know that we are not going to actually be there to represent ourselves in the judgment, which in a way makes it more scary, <laughs> even. But um, we can imagine that our ghostly legal souls file in somnol somnolent obsequiousness. That means sleepy humility before the king of kings. Our entire lives are naked before the onlooking universe. There's no A or A minus. It's only saved or d d d d d lost. You know what I mean by the d, right? Okay. Uh, that's pretty scary, huh? Um, but... What do you think about the theology of this picture? There's a lot of truth in there, isn't it? But what about this one? Does that one look a little closer? Now, it's true that Jesus is our judge. That's a really good thing. He's also the true witness, and he's the defense attorney. And better yet, even than that, he is my substitute. Okay? Everything is stacked in our favor. If you're with Jesus, you can't lose. As it says in 1 John 5, verse 12, this is the, this is the uh, assurance passage in the Bible. It's 1 John 5, 1, 11 to 13. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And in verse 12, right in the middle of that, it says, He, which is generic, anyone or she, who has the Son, has life. And that's not this life, that's eternal life. He who has the Son has life. And the Son is Jesus. 
So if we have a relationship with him, we have absolutely nothing to fear in the judgment. Praise the Lord for that. It's like Noah. He who has an ark has life. Right? And so uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. The judgment gives confidence. The judgment gives what? Confidence? Let me illustrate it this way just a little bit. Um, my wife and I, when we first got married, were uh, very poor. We were poor students. Both of us were students. And we didn't have money for vacations like regular people take. So we went backpacking. And it was wonderful. We went backpacking in the Sierra Mountains up near Carson Pass of Highway 50. Those of you, anyone been there? It's a stunning country. It's absolutely beautiful. And so this one time we, we had these heavy backpacks and we hiked over and down over a hill and then down 2,000 feet to 4th of July Lake, a beautiful lake down there. And then we went another 2,000 feet down to a place called Summit City Canyon, which I shouldn't advertise because I don't want a lot of people to go there. It's very private. Um, lovely place with a stream flowing through in those rocks. It's not like Michigan where the streams are a little muddy. But it's, it's all in rocks. It's just crystal clear. And there's all these trees around and there's wildlife and there's mountains up there. Absolutely beautiful. So we enjoyed that uh, for several days. And then on the last day, we were playing in the, that stream together, just like Adam and Eve, you know, playing in, in paradise. And um, we weren't paying attention to the time. Now, we had to be back the next day to work back in uh, Anglin, California. Now, to get back to work, we were going to have to uh, load up our backpacks and with those backpacks, climb up 2,000 feet to Fourth July Lake, 2,000 feet up uh, to get to, and then over the hill to where our car was, and then drive for four hours to get to. So we needed to leave like uh, in the morning, but we didn't. And we were there still in the afternoon. We were enjoying it too much. And we all of a sudden noticed the shadows are going down. Um, they're getting longer. The sun is going down. The shadows are getting longer. And we were in trouble. We knew we were in trouble. We just didn't have enough time. So we threw our stuff in our backpacks and we headed up the trail as fast as we could. And we didn't bother to take time for eating. We just pulled out some gorp. That's um, that was what we called um, trail mix, eating along the way. And we um, were trying to get out there to beat it out before the sun fell. Well, it was hopeless, a hopeless cause. We didn't make it. We got to the top of Elephant Back Mountain, which is thousands of feet high. It's above above the regular tree line. And there were no regular trees. There were little tiny shrubs and things like that. And, and we couldn't go any further because it got totally black. Black. And, and there were cliffs on the side. We knew that if we went on, we could get killed. We could fall off one of those cliffs. And uh, you couldn't even see your nose. Now, for me, that's quite a long ways, but uh, it was very, very, very uh, black. So we just had to throw down our backpacks, pull out no time, no, it, it wasn't going to be worthwhile to put up a tent. We just slept out of the open in our sleeping bags. But there was a problem. My wife heard a little rustling sound. A little rustling. Some little creature was with it, some, or, or some big creature. Some kind of rustling sound. What could it be? Now, she grew up in the country of Nepal as a missionary's daughter, and, where there were leopards. She encountered a le leopard one time behind a, a window with it right there, and it screamed at her when she was a little girl. She was terrified of big cats. And we knew that there were mountain lions out there in the Sierra Mountains. So she was laying there in her um, sleeping bag, and she was just shaking with fear because she thought that there must be a mountain lion out there, and it had on its menu for supper, Connie Gay. <laughs> she couldn't even speak to tell me what her fear was, and I didn't know. And then finally she got it out, and oh well, I grabbed a flashlight. You know, I'm a man. So grab a flashlight, I'm going to shine it at the fear, right? What, whatever it is, the source of where the sound is coming from. And I shot my flashlight right into the beady eyes of a tiny mouse. <laughs> well, once that happened and she knew it was a mouse, then the very sound, the rustling sound, that had given her, let's say, catatonic fear, right? 
That is funny. Okay. Um, now to the line. Uh, that very rustling sound now made her feel good, made her feel confident, because she knew that there wasn't a predator around to frighten the mouse. So the very source of the fear became a source of confidence. And that's what I'm hoping we're going to learn by shining a little light onto the source of the fear, namely the end time judgment. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. It's not a mouse, but it's... Um... First of all, the judgment gives confidence. It does condemn the disloyal, but it delivers the loyal. In the book of Daniel, it's all about deliverance from the oppressors. And do you remember what David said? Say it, judge me, O God. That means save me. Judge me. We don't think of wanting to be judged, but if we're being oppressed, we may want to get help from someone in authority to, to judge our case so that we can be free from that oppression. Do you remember Jesus' story about the widow who wanted freedom from oppression or whatever, she, whatever the circumstance was? And she went to a judge, and the judge didn't care about anything. So he didn't care about the widow or justice. And she kept knocking on his door, help, I need some help, judge me, judge me. And he didn't care. And finally, finally, he gave up because she was just bugging him. And yeah, okay, he judged the case. So you see, it can be a good thing to be judged if you're oppressed. Folks, are we all oppressed? We are, are oppressed by Satan and by his agents and by all these kind of things. We are oppressed. We need judgment. All right. Judgment is about mercy and its results for us and for our father judge. It's about mercy. That's what the judgment is about. And our judge is God. He is our father. And Christ is our judge. And so that is a wonderfully reassuring thing. It sets our confidence in concrete. That's the purpose of the judgment. Why do we need a judgment? We'll talk about that. Our fears are answered. We're judged by our works. Yeah, judged by our works. That's pretty terrifying, isn't it? Including all the secret things. The secret things. As evidence of saving faith. You see, why should it be that we're judged by our works when we're saved by grace through faith? Did you ever wonder about that? And people say, you Adventists, you must think that you're saved by works because you're judged by works. But no, we're saved by grace through faith. But judged by works doesn't contradict that. Why? Because the works are a symptom of the faith. Okay? Why do we need that works as a symptom of the faith? Because in the judgment, it's true that God is the judge. He can read our thoughts. But who is, is the judgment for the information of God? Is that the purpose? He knows everything from the beginning. He doesn't need a judgment to give him more information. We talk about the investigated judgment. He doesn't have to take a, a sabbatical and do research, you know, to have a, a, a good clear picture of what everyone has done. He knows everything from the beginning. So what is the purpose of the judgment? It's for the purpose of showing all of God's created beings that he is just so that they will want to follow him for eternity with free choice. That's the point. We mentioned that this morning, right? Love him forever with free choice. He doesn't withhold anything. Talk about disclosure. Okay? We have a president right now who won't even disclose his tax records. But the God of the universe, okay, everything is out there. It's like the Pentagon, the White House, everything. Just laying it all out open. Why? God doesn't want there to be any secrets. And um, if, if you wonder about the radical honesty of God, think about why did God create Lucifer? Have you ever wondered that? Why did God create Lucifer? Look, folks, if, um, if you and your wife knew that if you went to bed that night and you um, conceived a child, that child would be a serial killer. Would you maybe think of something else to do that evening? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I think so. God knew the future. He knew what Lucifer would do, and yet he made him with free choice. Now couldn't the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their intimate divine counsel have said, look, Let's just not go ahead and make Lucifer. Nobody's going to know. Nobody would have known. Not a soul. But they went ahead and did it anyway 
because they don't, God doesn't withhold anything from us. That is the level of radical openness and honesty of God. Incredible. So the fact is that the judgment of God is for the benefit of his created beings who are the jury. And you can see that in Daniel 7, 9 to 14, where you have the ancient of days take his seat. That's, that's the father. And then one like the son of man comes. But you have all of those myriads, millions, really, if you, myriads and myriads in, in Hebrew, of, um, of angels there. You have millions of them. And why are they there at the judgment? Why are they there? Because they're created beings. They need to be witnesses to everything that goes on, to know that God treats people fairly, and that he's saving the right people and not saving the right people. Because the rest of the universe doesn't want to be a, a dangerous neighborhood. Are we going to want to get to a new Jerusalem and be afraid to let our children run around the streets? Huh? Dangerous neighborhood? No way. And the, uh, if, you have, if you've ever wondered why um, our scientists with all their radio telescopes beaming messages into space, hoping someone will answer so we can learn about them. Why do we get, why do we get no answers? Folks, we're under quarantine. And if you want to know that life out there is intelligent, we know it's intelligent because they don't try to get in touch with us. Yeah. We're under quarantine. And so the fact is that God wants to let all these beings know. And, and how does he do that? It's through records of works. Works of faith or lack thereof. Faith working through love. It's the only kind of, of thing that matters. Now what's the relationship between faith and works? Let me ask you this question. Abraham, lechlecha, lechlecha. What does lechlecha mean? Clear as crystal, right? Get going. Get going, Abraham. Uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be moving now. Go to a land that I will show you and I'll make of you a great nation. Sarah, we're moving. Let's start packing up the baskets and loading the donkeys. So they do. They're loading up the donkeys. Tell me, folks, is that faith or is that works? Faith. Yes. 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 It's both. You can't separate faith from works. Because faith works. Huh? So it's valid to have the works part of faith, the visible part of faith, as the evidence in the judgment. And God uses that to show his creative beings. Now why can't he show them the faith part, the thoughts part of faith? Why can't he show them that? Because God's created beings cannot read thoughts. It's as simple as that. The fact that Jesus at Simon's feast could read his mind and know what he was thinking proves that Jesus was divine. Okay? But created beings, even the devil and his angels can't read our thoughts. Oh yeah, they can, they can monitor our pulse and see our eyes dilate and see where we're doing our acute genes of human behavior, right? But they can't actually read thoughts. So God cannot use that as evidence of the judgment. It's the works. God empowers our works through faith. We mentioned that this morning, Romans 5.5. 5. The Holy Spirit is poured into the hearts, into our hearts. Galatians 5.6, faith working through love. Philippians 2 verse 3, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, it says in verse 12. In verse 13, for it is God who works. And the word in Greek is from the verb from which we get the, the that root, the same root, we, we get the noun dynamite. The dynamite, the power is there. So you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How? By connecting with God, which is where the power comes from. Okay? He empowers our works through faith. So when we're converted and we turn to God, then... He is the source of what we're doing. Our forgiveness is undone only if we sever our covenant connection with him. As long as we hang on to that, we have, we have assurance of forgiveness. As long as we accept the transforming power. And as I mentioned this morning, when we say yes to God, we're not just saying yes, let everything stay the same. Right? Jesus takes us where we are, but he doesn't leave us where we were. And I'm so grateful for that. Because I don't want to be where I was <laughs> or where I am now. I want to be somewhere better. Romans 8, 1 to 17 is all about the Holy Spirit transforming the life. And this new walk that we have in the Spirit is different and it's better. Colossians 1, 21 to 23 uh, says just before this, you were all kinds of sinners, but now as a result of the transformation that God has given, you have something better. And then in verse 23 it says, provided that. 
Right? Here's the condition. Provided that you stay steadfast in the faith. You don't throw it away. You've got this gift, which is worth a lot, and you stay in the faith. And that's the condition. Just hang on to it. We don't vindicate God by our works. God vindicates himself by what he does for in and through us. I'm directly contradicting uh, M. L. Andreas in, in his book, The Sanctuary Service. Second to last chapter is called The Final Generation. There's a lot of truth there. Um, it's true that Christ gives us victory over sin, but I find it's too performance oriented, too oriented on my performance rather than outgoing to take the message to the world. And I think if I press M. L. and I can't because he's dead, I think he would probably agree with me, but he makes it very clear, we vindicate God by our works, and I think he would agree if I said, no, God vindicates himself. We are his exhibit A, B, C, and so on and so forth. We are the exhibit, and it's by what he's doing, he shows, look what I've done with this person. Okay? Rather than me feeling uh, the burden of God can't do without me, I'm pretty indispensable, see? That's not the way it is. And God vindicates himself in the judgment. Leviticus chapter 16, the day of atonement service. The cleansing of the sanctuary, we're going to study that a little later for the seminar, is all about God vindicating the forgiveness that he's already given. And also the fact that some people are condemned. He vindicates saving some, not saving some, and the cleansing of the sanctuary, which represents his residence, his authority, his reputation, like his White House. That is really showing that he is right in what he has done. And then Daniel 8.14, the sanctuary is justified. That's what it says in Hebrew. Under 2,300 evening morning or evenings and mornings, that is days, then the sanctuary shall be justified. That means legally cleansed. So if you say that the sanctuary will be cleansed, you mean legally cleansed in the sense of God being blameless, clean uh, as a result of that. The works that are relevant to the judgment follow conversion. Now, the woman taken in adultery, Jesus said to her in John 8, verse 11, he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, the earlier part of her life was flushed down the drain. It was gone. But Jesus is saying, now that you're being forgiven, how much is that worth? A trillion dollars? More than that, it's eternity, right? She's forgiven. Now hang on to that forgiveness that you receive as a free gift. Don't throw it away. Okay? That's what he's saying. And this is the part of our lives, the conversion part, is the part that's empowered by God through his spirit. So everything is in our favor. God doesn't hold us accountable for all that bad stuff we did before we uh, joined Christ, before we accepted him. It's only from conversion on, unless we choose to throw it away. And if we throw it away, of course, we're saying, I don't want you, I'll take back all my sins and all that bad stuff. Now, sin, of course, is a really nasty, stinky thing. It's unloved, it's unselfishness, it's hurtful, it's oppressive. And we, we take all of that stuff back, all the lust and the, and the hatred and all that, we, we take back. But if we don't do that, if we hang on to that, and we keep allowing God to work in us. And we don't stay the same. We're always different. You know, like we're kind of like a, a tree. A tree has a, a layer. I, I think it's called the Cambrian layer. Is that what it's called? Cambrian layer? And that's the part that's growing. It's just one band around there, underneath the bark. And that's the part that's growing and expanding. And that puts down, puts out one ring on that tree every year. Did I get that right? Okay, and the tree grows like this. If it's not growing, it's dead. That's the way we are. We are living in that Cambrian layer. It's, it's one day at a time. And we're building our character like this. Positive outcome we get from allowing God to work his will in the life. The judgment is in heaven. So we don't know when our names come up. That's pretty scary, isn't it? My name starts with, a last name starts with G. So am I the seventh in the alphabet? Let's see if I can figure this no, no, you don't know when it's going to come up, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We don't know when our names come up because genuine, ongoing commitment. It's not a hypocritical, temporary show. Oh, my name's coming up? Better put her in my spiritual tuxedo. See? 
and my bow tie and get all gussy up and then I go and meet the Lord. Now I look pretty good, huh? Like if you're going to have a date with someone, it's a long time ago for me, but uh, ah, I'm, I am dating my wife. Um, that's a good thing to do. And uh, so, but if you're going to go on a date, you want to look good for that occasion, right? But God wants to know, what do we look like when we first get up in the morning? Okay? How are we all during the day? Not just when we are knowing that we're going to be evaluated. God does tell us when the judgment begins and what to expect. Revelation 14, verse, verses 6 to 12. He tells us, the hour of his judgment has come. That is since 1844. We know that we're living in the period of the judgment, which is not only us, but all of humanity from all ages are being uh, considered in that situation. And so we know the overall time, we just don't know where we are on the program. We're in the program, we just gotta be there for the whole program, right? The end of the judgment is a relief. In fact, I believe in once saved, always saved. At the end of the judgment. That's when, it, that's when Revelation 22 verse 11 um, is, is when uh, God says, he that is holy, let it be holy still. He that is filthy, let it be filthy still, right? And that's when we're sealed and our fate is sure for all of eternity. And that's a wonderful thing. I'm looking forward to that. You know, we often look back at 1844 or 1888. We look back, back at our heritage, our pioneers and all that. But you know, what pioneers are doing is they're looking ahead. Pikes peak or bust, right? Pioneers are looking ahead. And, and I think that if our pioneers were here, they would be looking ahead to the next great salvation event, which is the end of the judgment. That's the ceiling when everything is going to be set in concrete. And that's a wonderful thing. It's going to be a relief. We'll be safe with God for all eternity. Final commitment we have. God matures our character, although our nature continues the way it is until the second coming when he changes this nature even. We won't even have propensities uh, to sin and that kind of thing. But in the meantime, 2 Peter 1 verse 4 says, we can be partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 verse 4, partakers of the divine nature. Isn't that magnificent? So that we don't have to just be um, dependent upon our old nature to control us. We have something new that we can, it, it's not that we are to the point that we no longer have these propensities and these desires that come from being fallen and broken, but it's that we're grabbing onto a higher strength and we can't overcome. There's gonna be room for further moral growth. Has anyone here ever started a business? Started a business? Were you in debt when you started your business? Anyone in debt? Yeah, and then you grew your business until you got to the point that you had zero balance, zero balance. I have nothing, but I owe nothing. Is there room for further moral growth? Yes. Uh, not moral growth, financial growth. Yes. Just ask Bill Gates or uh, Jeff Bezos, right? There's plenty of room for further growth. And when we get to the point that uh, we're glorified and Jesus takes us home, we're, we're not going to be sinning anymore, are we? But is that the end of our moral growth? No, it's the beginning. We'll be growing through all eternity. Because what is moral growth? It's growing in love. And our love is going to increase with all the interactions we have through the ages of eternity. And as we learn more and more about God's love and his creation and what he did through Christ and all these people we get to talk with, the biblical characters that we get to meet. So our love is going to increase. There's plenty of room for moral growth. Here are five kinds of confidence that we can have on, on the judgment, during the judgment, which is right now. Access to God. Now, Hebrews 4 talks about access to God all through the Christian era. We have a hotline to heaven. Come boldly to the throne of grace anytime, anywhere. And we can connect with Jesus, who sympathizes with us in all of our weaknesses, because he's being tempted in all points as we, as we have. So come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, that's true more than ever now because Jesus has his headquarters in the Holy of Holies and he's doing a special ministry ministry, and he's, he's doing mediation as well as judgment. He doesn't stop, stop the mediation when he starts to do the judgment, right? And so we can have that access to God anytime. God is fair. 
Anybody hear about the Lindy Chamberlain case? I know there's a brother from Australia here. Yes, you know about the Lindy Chamberlain case. Okay, the, the rest of you too? Uh, okay. There was a, an Adventist minister and his wife took their family camping at Ayers Rock in the middle of Australia. It's located in the Northern Territory, which comes down like that, but it's in the middle, middle of Australia. And in the middle of the night, their baby daughter disappeared. And there was a trail of blood. And so the um, Northern Territory police, to make a long story short, arrested them. Uh, they were accused of killing that baby girl. And the Lindy Chamberlain ended up in prison in the Northern Territory jail and suffered there a lot. She gave birth and all the rest of it. It was terrible suffering. And um, because justice in the world is not always fair, right? Just, human justice doesn't know everything and it doesn't have a perfect loving character. It can discriminate against people, okay? And that, that can be a problem. I think you know what I'm talking about. But God knows everything and he is infinite love. God is fair. If our cases are in his hand, praise the Lord, we're safe. And in Psalm 96, you've got even the trees clapping their hands because God is fair. It's a wonderful thing. The judgment brings deliverance from oppression, saves us from the evil one, the oppressors who are oppressing the holy ones of the Most High. This, this little horn power in Daniel 7 is, um, is oppressing them. And in Daniel 7 verse 22, it says, judgment is given for the saints, for the holy ones. That's you and me, if we're with Christ. It's given for our benefit. Another thing is the imminence of Christ's second coming, because if this is the last phase of salvation, like the Day of Atonement was at the end of the year of the Israelites. That is the religious year. Then we know that the next great thing is the end of the judgment, then right away Christ comes again. And that's very exciting that we know that we live now. Anytime after 1844, he can come back. But perhaps the most important one is we can know that we're in a saved relationship with God. And in Psalm 50, verses three to six, it welcomes God to come as the judge and he says, I have gathered my faithful ones to judgment. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Have we made a covenant with him by sacrifice? Yes, we have, and that's Jesus' sacrifice. And those are the ones, the faithful ones that he gathers to himself. First John 5, 11 to 13, I mentioned, he who has the son has life. She who has the son has life. Now, we've talked about confidence. Let's talk about participation. Do we participate in this end-time judgment? In fact, in the third angel's message, it says God's people keep the commandments of God and hold Jesus' faith. And this is during the time when the first angel's message says he's proclaiming an everlasting gospel on the earth and saying the hour of his judgment has come. So during the time of the judgment, this is how we participate. We keep the commandments of God, which are about love, we hold fast to Jesus' faith, which is also about uh, love. Notice that in Revelation 14, verse 4, when God's people get to heaven, they're following the Lamb wherever He goes. The Lamb is Christ. Following the Lamb wherever He goes. I just want to be with Jesus. Do you think they start doing that when they get to heaven? No. It's what they're used to. That's just their habit. And those are the people he's going to take with him, those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And in Genesis 12, Abraham followed the Lord wherever he led. And in Genesis 22, the Lord even led him to Mount Moriah. And the Lord asked him to sacrifice his son. And he was willing to give up everything for God. Um, of course, God provided a substitute representing Christ. So this is a wonderful thing. Going where God leads, that's the key. That's the key. God's basic call is the same. And when I wrote my book um, called Altar Call, I shared it with some friends. I gave a copy to my pastor, Dwight Nelson. And when he read that book, the thing that struck him the most, that he singled out for mention, was the idea that the people at the end time, the final generation, which is maybe us, do not have a different kind of faith than people before. It's not, a, it's not that all of a sudden we have this, this elevated kind of experience. It's that 
We have the same kind of faith as these people in the Bible stories. They were ordinary people like us, but they said yes to God, and he led them. And they followed where he led, and he took them to places where people hadn't gone before. And with us, the same is true. But we're going to go somewhere different because he's, lead, he's going to lead us to somewhere different. It's not because we have some elevated kind of faith that they didn't have. The Day of Atonement showed loyalty by humbling through self-denial and not working. We talked about this this morning. Christ obeyed the Father and humbled himself. Participation in life and death matter. During the judgment, we participate because the judgment involves our fates. Do you remember Esther when she talk, talked to Mordecai and she said, I'm going to go in before the king. And it could cost me my life. But gather all the people of Susa and tell them to fast as I and my maids are fasting. And then I'm going to go in to see the king. And if I perish, I perish. But she was going in there to intercede for her people, for all of them. She wanted them to participate with her. They couldn't go in to see the king with her. But they could show solidarity. They could enter into the experience with her in fasting, interceding to God to protect her and to protect the people. So this is a very important thing. We participate here, just as the ancient Israelites, they could not go into the Holy of Holies with their high priest. But God said, practice self-denial wherever you are, fasting and so on. And that way, you enter into this experience, you participate, showing that you really care about what the high priest is doing for you to intercede. That makes perfect sense. This is a life and death matter. Self-denial at a time of special need. In Ezra 8.21, Ezra and the other uh, returnees from the exile are going back to Palestine. And they're leaving Mesopotamia. And Ezra didn't want to ask the Persian king for an armed guard because that would show lack of faith. But they were going to be traveling through dangerous territory, potentially. There could be bandits out there. And they would carry gold and silver vessels from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had taken which would be a fair game, of course, for, for people who would want to steal it and, and attack them. And so they stopped by the river Ahava and they prayed and they practiced self-denial, the same expression that's used in Leviticus, almost same meaning, almost the same expression. And they, they petitioned God for safety at that time. Psalm 35, the psalmist, same expression, petitions God for a sick friend. Daniel chapter 10, and so on. Daniel petitions for more knowledge. So this experience of self-denial, which the Israelites were to do on the Day of Atonement, is something that is for a special time of need, and that's appropriate for our time. Yes, it's true. We lift up our heads, we rejoice because our redemption is drawing on. We should be joyful and happy, and love makes you happy. Love and joy go together, right? At the same time, we need to realize that we are in a special time of need. And we need to be staying close to God and asking for that and interceding for others. Now let's talk about total commitment. We've talked about confidence and participation, but now total commitment during the judgment. At the end of the Israelites' day of atonement, which was their judgment day, their sins were no longer relevant, the ones that they had done before. Leviticus 16 verse 30 says, for on this day, atonement shall be made for all your sins. You shall be clean before the Lord. Clean before the Lord. What does that mean? That means blameless. Their sins are not only forgiven, but they had affected God's sanctuary. We're going to talk about that later in the seminar. And But now, those are gone even from then. They're no longer relevant. Okay? It's cleansed. The record is cleansed. It's like on your computer, you drag a, a document into the trash. But you can pull it out again, can't you? But if you empty the trash, it's gone. And that's what happens. The trash is empty on that day. Now this reminds us of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. This is the new covenant passage where Jeremiah says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, not like the covenant that I made with your forefathers at Sinai, which they broke. The problem was not that he gave them a piece of junk for a covenant. The problem was that they broke it. And if you have a relationship and one of the parties goes bad, you have a bad covenant, right? So, but at the end of that, he says, 
I'm going to pour my, uh, put my law in your hearts. It's going to be internalized. The commandments will be internalized. That means that if you break them, if you break the, those internalized commandments, that's what you could call a myocardial infraction. Okay? And, um, and, and, and yet, what is the ground for all of this? What's the basis for this new covenant? And it says in the second half of Jeremiah 31, verse 34, it says for. That means because. So everything above, this new covenant, all the blessings, pouring the putting the law on the hearts, is all based on this. What is it? For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. Forgiveness and no more remembering. Does that mean that God is so ancient of days that he gets forgetful, he gets amnesia, and he forgets it? No, that's not what it means. It means that he makes our sins eternally relevant. They can never come up again. Amen. Right? And that's a very, very wonderful thing. Now, put, contrast that with Matthew 18, the story of the unjust steward. There was this uh, steward who worked for a king, and he was a very powerful person. He had a lot of budget, but he had um, gotten in tremendous debt. And in fact, he was in debt to the king. Thousands of talents, 10,000 talents in fact. 10,000 talents in today's money is millions of dollars. He's millions of dollars in debt to the king who could just say, off with his head. I want my money, right? Or his head. And he goes and he pleads to the king and the king has mercy on him and forgives him the debt. He goes out from there, and the first person he meets is one of his fellow servants, and he grabs him by the throat, tries to drag out of him a hundred denarii, which is small change. Right? Word gets back to the king, this guy didn't forgive his brother, his, his fellow servant. And the king is furious. Now the king had forgiven, but had the king forgotten? He hadn't forgotten. And in fact, when you're forgiven, but you don't pass it on, Jesus says, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, right? And if you don't forget, forgive others, you haven't received forgiveness in the first place. Because God's forgiveness is not like a sterile mule. You know, a mule comes from a donkey and a horse, but the mule is sterile. Our forgiveness is not sterile. It's got to be able to reproduce, otherwise you don't have a real thing. Yeah? It reminds me of Corey Ken Boom, Corrie Ten Boom was that Dutch lady and her family was living in, I think, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and they were hiding Jewish people. They got caught, they got put in the Ravensbrück Nazi concentration camp. Her sister died, I think her mother died, they were terribly mistreated. There were guards that would make the women parade naked before them and leering and jeering, and they were terribly cruel to them. And so on. after the war, Corrie Ten Boom packed her bags and she traveled all over the world speaking her story and ministry. And one day, she writes about this in one of her books. One day, uh, after she spoke, up came to her a man who, who introduced himself, and he was one of those guards at Ravensbrook, who was so nasty and mistreating him. And there was this terrible struggle in, in Corey's mind. Uh, what's she gonna do? You know, this guy abused us. I mean, he was part of the reason for the death of my family members and all the rest of it. And then she remembered that if you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive others. And so she gingerly reached out her hands, and when she shook the hand of that man, there was this tremendous sense of release and relief. Okay? Forgiving is one of the hardest things we do. And yet, when we let go like that, we let go, then this is what God requires of us to do, and he totally for, he, he forgives us. If we don't forgive, then we're not forgiven. But, but he makes the sins ultimately irrelevant to the point that nobody in all eternity can bring that up and hold that against us. That's a really wonderful thing. But that's what's happening during the judgment. By the end of the judgment, that's already occurred. The people were clean in Leviticus 16, verse 30. That means blameless in Revelation 14, verse 5. Clean is legally clean, and that's blameless. Now, um, when I was in graduate school at the University of California at Berkeley, has anyone heard of what Berkeley is like? When I was there, it was uh, the number one university in the country all around. 
Um, my university was competing with the Soviet Union for Nobel Prizes. Uh, we had one less prize than the whole Soviet Union. And um, when it comes time for Olympics, the University of California, Berkeley, is so big, so powerful, that it wins more gold medals from its students than many countries do. So it was a great university, but there's also a very strong street culture in Berkeley. This is where LSD was invented by Timothy Leary. And um, I saw a piece of graffiti once that said, um, reality is the state induced by the lack of LSD. Okay, okay so suppose, suppose now, um, I didn't do this, but suppose um, there was a Berkeley potluck. Not haystacks, but you bring your own pot. Um, you own marijuana and share your marijuana, okay? So the Berkeley potluck, and, and, and the kids are, Students are sitting around smoking pot, and the air is thick with the nice sweet aroma of uh, sweet grass smell. And in come the cops to bust them. They have their handcuffs, and they start handcuffing these guys. But one guy hasn't been doing that. He was just there for the company. He's sitting in a corner, and he's reading a Time magazine, and uh, the cops come over to him to arrest him, and he says, I'm clean! Now, that's, that's California street language. Clean. What does that mean? I'm blameless. That's exactly the language the Bible uses, clean, okay? And uh, naki is the word in, in Hebrew, and there are other uh, words as well. So in Leviticus 16, verse 30, it, the word is tahor. That's another word that means clean. We're going to be blameless at that point uh, by the end of the judgment. Judgment recognizes human choices. Did God force anyone to get on Noah's ark? Did God force anyone to get off Noah's ark? He let whoever wanted to get on stay there, and he respected their free choice, okay? And then he just shut the door, acknowledging their free choice. See, God respects our free choice so much. Did you realize that? Genesis 4, verse 7, God warned Cain after he was angry because he um, hadn't had his sacrifice accepted, where his, his younger brother, his sacrifice was accepted. And God said to Cain, if you do well, will be accepted. But if not, sin is crouching at the door. Now what does that mean, sin is crouching at the door? Does sin sit outside like God and, and just knock? Does sin knock? No. Uh, we had a pussy cat. His name was Charlie. Charlie wanted to be an indoor cat, but he had to be an outdoor cat and live in our shed outside because I'm allergic to cats. And, but sometimes we would find Charlie inside the house. We have no idea how he got there. I used to say, the phantom of the pussycat is here. <laughs> I have no idea how this cat got in the house. But, but, but look, sin is not like a pussycat that wants to sit on your lap and purr. It's more like a saber-toothed tiger because his desire is for you. <laughs> yeah. You get the picture? Sin wants to bust in. Sin is not going to wait for the door to open. It's going to bust the door down. What do you find by way of contrast? in Revelation 3, verse 20, which contrasts with sin and Satan. They want to break the door down, but Jesus stands outside the door, outside the door, and knocks. He created you. He died for you. He has every right to come in, to just pick the lock. He can pick the lock, or he can just come right in with the door still there. And yet he stands outside and knocks politely. And if anyone will open the door, then he will come in. See how God respects your free choice? And that's the kind of God we can love. You can't love someone who doesn't respect your free choice. And there's a story about a, uh, a Western reporter went to the Soviet Union during the time of Stalin, that vicious dictator who was responsible for the deaths of 20 million or more people. And so he went there and he wanted to find out um, what people thought of Stalin. So he would go up to someone, what do you think of Stalin? And their face would just turn away. The blood would drain from their face and they would turn away. Nobody would say a word. What do you think of Same thing. Finally, says to this man, what do you think of Stalin? And the man says, follow me. So he follows him. Up and down alleyways, always looking back to make sure the KGB secret police weren't following. And then into the big GUM department store. Up and down the aisles, always looking to make sure no one's following him. And then they get in a, a, taxi, a, a taxi and they drive through Gorky Park, always making sure no one's following them. They drive way out into the country and the taxi leaves, and out there in the country there is a 
um, a, a lake and there's a boat and they get in the boat and they row to the middle of the lake and there's nobody around and the reporter says to the man now i think we're safe <laughs> can you tell me what do you think it's done and the man said i like him <laughs> see the people weren't free they weren't free even to express their their liking of Stella. They were so afraid. That's just a story, but it illustrates the point. Yeah. Okay, so we have to have free choice. Revelation 22, 11. God is going to simply uh, close the ark door at the end, at the end of the judgment. Respect our free choice. And that's it. You could freely get on. You can freely get off. Up to a point. And then that's the end. What more was there to do for my garden, for my vineyard that I had already done in it? was the question in Isaiah chapter 5. What more could I have done for my vineyard? The vineyard is Judah that I have not already done in it. When God runs out of options, then that's when the end comes, when he runs out of options. Only so much he can do, Isaiah 5 verse 4. Commitments are settled by the second coming. He brings his reward with him. It's not like a Billy Graham evangelistic meeting. I went to one of those in Omaha, Nebraska years ago. Very, very, uh, very impressive. Billy Graham would make his appeal, his altar call, and then thousands of people would start coming forward. The counselors first, and then others would come to give their lives to Christ. And while, while the choir is saying, just as I am with a foot one, two, right? Just as I am. I can't sing it. If I did, we'd have to use these emergency exits. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the choir would sing, and there was an appeal for people to give their life. Jesus is not going to come back and make an appeal while the angels sing. He has his reward with him. He comes and he separates the sheep from the goats. It's just like that. The gospel proclamation, however, will have clarified the choice for people. And the outpouring of the Spirit will have helped prepare for the end. In fact, the Spirit just speeds up the choices we've already made. You get some 11th hour Christians. You remember the parable of the workers of the 11th hour? And God just speeds up the work for them and for everybody else. It's like an elevator. You go and you push up or down. And then if you don't choose the speed, the, cho the speed is chosen for you. And if you're at the administration building at Andrews University, it's one of the slowest elevators in the world and is very, very... But if you go up, um, Sears Tower, it used to be called, it was the tallest building in the world at one time, it's changed its name now, I don't remember what it is. You go up there and it's, you feel G-forces, right? So there's different speeds an elevator could take. You make the choice which direction you go and then God determines the speed, and it's going to be fast at the end. The Holy Spirit convicts, transforms, sanctifies through love. When Christ stops mediating for sins, he'll be closer to us than ever. That statement by Ellen White uh, used to haunt me. We'll stand before a holy God without a mediator in great controversy. But Jesus also said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in Ephesians 5, He'll prepare the bride for himself. Will the bridegroom abandon the bride? No, he's going to stay with us. And in Genesis 32, we find that where was, where was Christ when Jacob was wrestling with this angel? Where was Christ? Christ was that man wrestling with him. In other words, during the time of Jacob's trouble, folks, Christ will be closer to us than ever, namely in our arms. Okay? He will not leave us or forsake us. And when Ellen White said that we will stand before a holy God without a mediator, that just means a mediator to forgive sins because he will no longer to do that, need to do that anymore. It's not that he walks off the job and leaves some of us to perish or is just waiting for the moment. Got him! Okay? That's not the way Jesus works. It's that the job is done. Years ago, I was making, um, well, I was interested in learning how to build a house. So I took a construction course. This is after I finished college. I wanted to learn to be a practical person like Jeff Gurney. And so I, uh, he taught me a lot of things, including how to use a chainsaw, which is why I'm alive today. Um, and so uh, I wanted to learn how to build a house. And I got a job after that, building a house, so I could really learn on the job. And it was down in the Napa Valley, quite a big, nice, fancy house. And uh, when we finished the job, I wasn't fired, I wasn't really laid off, but there was no more work. Why? Because the work was done. It was just finished, the job was done. 
And then there was no more work. Jesus is going to quit when he has matured everyone in their decision to where it's done. He doesn't need to be doing that anymore. And then he's going to walk off the job and then he'll come back for us. Followers of Christ can have the same kind of loyalty as Caleb. We will have followed him. It's not a unique kind of loyalty. We'll be blameless as a group. It's a special kind of group holiness. This is why it's so important. Our unity, our unity. And Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that they may be one, that the world may know. You get the, you get the relationship between that? The greatest witness to the world is our love, our unity, because that's not the way people normally get along. Right? There's all kinds of backbiting and all kinds of stuff. But if this group of people is getting along, there's something different about you folks. And, and there are people who are looking all over for the perfect society, or at least a good, at least a better society. I knew a young man like that. And he, he was going all over the place trying to look for a good society that he could join. And he never found it. So we will be emulating Christ. And this love that he gives us will draw us closer together and to him. Now this is, um, at the end here, I'm going to just show you a couple of historical pictures. This one is, oh, I guess it's not here. I'm going to have to go over here. All right. This is my father. This is my mother. This is my little brother. And this is me. We're standing on the deck of a ship called the Oriana. It was 42,000 tons. This is on June 27, 1962. My father had decided that he wanted to get more education, and that was going to be in the United States. So six months before this, he quit his job at Evandale College, took an interim position as a pastor evangelist, and we left a lot of our stuff behind. And then we, we sh kept shedding more stuff because we could only take with us what we could have in some big uh, wooden crates. In those days, you didn't fly. Flying was more expensive than going on a ship like this, believe it or not. And so we had to discard our stuff. And one of the things we did when we were living in Cessna, just before we went here, we went to the dump one day and we had to dump our toys. Now, I was, I was six, almost seven. My brother was four, almost five. And we had to leave our toys at the dump. Now, my brother has never recovered from that. And so when he's gotten older, you know, the difference between men and boys is the cost of their toys, right? And so he has some pretty fancy toys. Okay, so we kept having to leave stuff behind. And now here's the big day. And we got there, and I was just amazed by the size of the ship, how high it is and everything. 42,000, about the size of the Titanic, right? And we have ships like much bigger than that today, but for me it was pretty big. And so here we are standing on the deck and we've gone up the gangplank. The gangplank is still there. And here are these streamers. These are colored ribbons. And the people on the boat are holding onto one end of those streamers and on the other end are the people down on the deck, on, on, rather on the dock. And on the dock, here's my grandmother, my mother's mother and her husband my grandfather, other relatives are in here somewhere. And um, they were crying. I couldn't figure out why they're crying. Uh, I was going off on a wonderful adventure for three years. We were going to America for three years. My dad was gonna go and he was gonna get a doctor and come back after three years. What's the big deal? And it's gonna be a lot of excitement. Why, why, why are these, my grandmother crying? Couldn't figure it out. And um, then the gangplank was Hold up. See, before that, we could have chosen. My dad almost had decided, this is too much. I'm just going to walk down the gangplank and go back, take my family, and stand on straight. Um, but stay there. And then that option was no longer available because they took the gangplank up. And then the big engines started to go, and the water started to churn, and we started to move away from the dock. And those ribbons started to become tighter and tighter, more and more taut, until finally those ribbons broke. That was the day the streamers broke. That was the end of the first part of my life because we never made it back to live in Australia again. My father, my parents ran out of money here. He got a job pastoring and teaching college. And later on, he ended up at the General Conference editing the Sabbath School Quarterly. 
we, we went back to Australia just to visit, never made it back to, to live. So my wife is American, my daughter is American. They speak with an American accent, I think. And we're American, because that was the first part of our life. Everything changed. Everything changed in my life at that point. How much more is going to change when we get on Michael's big boat? Huh? And we leave all of our earthly ties behind. Everything is done. It's total commitment. But we are going to the other side with Jesus. We're committed. Michael, row your boat ashore. Okay? We're going to get to that other side. And that is, that is absolute commitment. You can't take anything with you except those that you love, your relationships. And may that be everybody, everybody that, that you love. This is what the judgment is all about. Okay? It's about God showing his character ultimately, showing that his created beings can live in harmony with him. He's going to take us to the other side with total commitment. We're going to live with him forever. This is the part of the everlasting gospel. This is an incredible message. And that's the positive message of the judgment. It's not out to get you. The judgment is not to find out if you have sinned. Does God need a judgment to find out if you've sinned? How many have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Everyone. Yeah. Romans 3. Romans 3. God doesn't need that for them. The judgment is to show who is being forgiven who accepts that transforming grace that God has given, that mercy. And those are the ones who are going to get on that boat. They're going to stay on that boat. They're going to go to the other side. Let's have a prayer. Father in heaven, we want to be on that boat with you, that metaphorical boat. And Father, I often envision in my mind the incredible scene when we lift off this troubled world, leaving behind it all of the pollution, all of the fires, all of the destruction, the hatred, selfishness, the lust, everything. And we lift off away from this planet with Jesus at the head of a long column of angels and the saved people of all ages. And Father, I want to be there. I want, to, want everyone here to be there. May it be soon. At that moment, we'll have this intense sense of relief. It's over. We're safe now. Satan is back there on earth. He can haunt us no longer. He's back there with his angels. He's done all of this messed up work. Tried to ruin our lives. Tried to take us to the sea of fire. And yet, here we are with Jesus. Save the last. That's what your judgment is about. Thank you for the confidence. Thank you that we can participate. And thank you for giving us this commitment. May it be total. And may it affect every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.